Hi, I'm Ian. Thanks for tuning in to another video episode on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm here again with Bin Shi, author on uh, Chinese American author on Chinese firearms of World War II and the, the Second Sino-Japanese War. And uh, we have today a selection of some of the more common um, Chinese bolt-action rifles that were used uh, during the developed early in the 1900s and used through World War II. So, uh, Bin, where should we start? Okay, I think the first one we should mention. Uh, is the Hanyang rifle, as we all know it. Uh, in the Chinese definition, was Han 88, because it was originally the licensed copy, actually, from the German commissioned rifle, 18, and, uh, 1888. And the uh, differences here would be that it actually deleted the barrel jacket and increased the outer diameter of the uh, barrel, so it doesn't mean that and can put an upper handguard to it and you would not find those in the original uh, commissioned rifle. And uh, this rifle production started uh, in 1895 all the way to uh, 1943. So you can say this is most produced rifle in China at yep. that period. It's one of the uh, yeah, it's over, probably over a million copy was produced. And uh, it was also produced in several different locations uh, location as well, in, uh, outside of the Hanyang. The, uh, Production facility was transferred to the first, the 21st arsenal uh, in 1941. So the later guns would bear the uh, so-called reverse swastika, the symbol on mm -hmm. the receiver, and the original the marking was a star, five-point star. And uh, some other smaller the facility also produced them. So it's a very popular gun the, during the uh, during before and during the World War II. Okay, and how were these loaded? Uh, this was loaded by a Imbra, uh, so five rounds would be in an Imbra and loaded from the top. And after all five rounds were fired, the Imbra would fall from the bottom. So it's sort of like uh, M1 Garand uh, concept, and, uh, except M1 Garand obviously jet from the top. Okay. And this used the round nose uh, ammunition, mm. by the way. Okay. And the uh, Chinese uh, cartridge was 204 grand, I believe. All right. We were discussing a little earlier off camera. Um, most of the, the Chinese weapons of this era were in 8 millimeter Mauser caliber. Mm -hmm. But uh, that wasn't necessarily what they were. There, there was some early discussion on what caliber yes. to use. There was a lot of document uh, actually recorded a debate among the generals and politicians at the time about the uh, merit of the 6.5 millimeter and the 7.92 millimeter. And uh, one of the reports stated that if men or the uh, uh, horses get shot by the 6.5, might still be able to move. But once you get shot with the 7.92 the cartridge uh, bullet, you're done. So in the end, they actually make a compromise. They had Mauser actually design a 6.8 by 57 cartridge. And this is very rare today, and usually when people refer to Mauser 1907, uh, it was in that caliber. And China produced that for several years, and called it Yuan Yan Si, year one type, uh, long rifle with a 6.8, but eventually, after a few years, in about 1988, 1918-ish, uh, 18 they abandoned the 6.8 as well, okay. and uh, go back to 7.92. And uh, they've been using that uh, throughout the Civil War and the World War II period, World War period up to the 1950s. Okay, made a lot more logistical sense, I'm sure, mm -hmm. since no one else had that 6.8 caliber. Yeah, and I think one of the big problem was that uh, they can't make any machine guns uh, using that caliber. The only machine gun they uh, mentioned he was using that uh, was the Austria, the Schwarzkopf, okay. and they actually made a copy of that in 6.8. Other than that, there was no mention of any other machine guns using that caliber. Okay. So the second gun you brought here? Uh, this is an interesting gun, right? And some people call it a mystery gun because the origin of it is, you know, still in discussion. Because it has a dust cover and it has a bolt uh, very similar to the Arisaka uh, design. It has the uh, firing pin and uh, enclosing the uh, main spring, right? And it's, but it has the Mauser the features, as you can see. Right, the rear right? side and the front band. Yeah, and the front lock, right? 
the uh, two front law. And has, so it has, it's a mixture of Arisaka and the original Mauser. And so some speculated that the uh, J Japanese designer actually designed this gun for the uh, Manchurian arsenal. But uh, a document shows that the uh, uh, China actually purchased the license from Austria. The Austria you know, actually designed this gun at the end of World War I, but never put it into production. And mm -hmm. so this was actually uh, most likely an original uh, you know, gun from the Austrian design. And as you can see, it still all has all the old features with the beret hook, the drill front, the hand guards, and no the, uh, rail swivel. Yeah. Right. And this has all the original the Mauser uh, 98 design. Right. How many of these were manufactured? Uh, there were approximately about 150,000 produced. And uh, due to the uh, Manchurian incident, about half of them were in storage when the Japanese took over Manchuria. Okay. So it's also a very rare gun. And it's made in very high quality. Yeah, As you can like see, that. the receiver was in the white, and the brewing was very smooth and shiny. All right. And it has the simplified uh, front band, as you can see. Right. Interesting. And the next gun we want to look at is a early version of the Zhang Hai Shek rifle. Again, the, you can look at it. This is a, a copy of the uh, a licensed copy of the standard model. Parade hook, front band drill hole, no rear swivel, right? And the marking here stated this gun was produced in the uh, August of uh, 1935. It's a pre-production unit, and it's still in a very good condition. All the numbers match. Now, why was this called a, a Chiang Kai-shek rifle? Originally, it was designated as Type 24 because 1935 was the, uh, the 24th year of the Republic. Uh, because the Chiang Kai-shek actually visited the arsenal, and so the uh, general in charge of the ordnance uh, matter actually proposed to change the name to Chiang Kai-shek model. And Chiang Kai-shek is a pronunciation in Cantonese. Uh, in the uh, Mandarin, Jiang Zhongzhi. So it's a Zhong Zheng Shi, it's the actual name. Okay. So it was just kind of to brown nose up to the guy in charge? Yeah, pretty much. At the time, there were a lot of the different stuff was named Zhong Zheng Shi, for example, the, uh, the compass produced at the time, the uh, binocular 6x30 binocular produced at the time, they all called Zhong Zheng Shi. Okay. And that, that was a mainstay rifle of the, the Chinese military? Correct. During World War II, this was a mainstay. And, uh, this gun was a very late gun, produced by the 21st Arsenal. They were kind of late in the game. Uh, they were ordered to produce them in the, uh, 1941, and it took them three years right, to start producing them. But they very soon become the uh, uh, biggest producer of rifles in China. And as you can see, some of the features have been eliminated. There's no parade hook, there's no drill, there's the uh, string three bow in the back. It's interesting that even though this is a late model gun, other than a few simplifications, it still looks to have been a very high quality manufacturer. Correct. And uh, also, uh, one thing worth mentioning is that at this stage, all the steel was made in uh, China. There's no more import uh, materials. All the material, wood, the steel, heat treatment, and everything was made in China. And the Chinese were able to move their manufacturing facilities far enough away from the fighting Yes. To, to maintain a high quality manufacturer? Yes. They actually were planning, way before the year 1937, China announced that uh, a fight with Japan is, was uh, inevitable. So they were planning to use Sichuan province, where Chongqing located, as the uh, rear end uh, to support the war effort. So a lot of people, organization, planning was going to uh, uh, Sichuan at the time to uh, make it into a uh, rear support base. As soon as the war started in 1937, all the uh, major arsenals started moving, uh, going to the west, to the south, to the Sichuan province. And there was one report about the uh, Hanyang arsenal, is that uh, after they moved, an American uh, representative from the embassy visited Hanyang arsenal. He said, uh, he said, he reported that even a dog knot was removed. So everything <laughs> was gone. And uh, one thing we need to keep in mind, Russia did the same thing. 
right. Right? they move all the arsenal to the rear. But Russia has a lot of the better infrastructure, railroad and roads, highway. China did not have that. So these heavy machinery, materials, all had to move by carriage, by boat, and go through a thousand miles of distance to go to the grid. Yeah, and another thing I want to mention is the, uh, the bell net of the Chiang Kai-shek model. It's especially long because at the time, all most of the uh, ancient ancient uh, countries still believe in the uh, constant uh, combat. And so, because the rival itself was shorter, so bell net was made extra long okay. to compensate the length of bridge. And the uh, early production uh, bell net scabbard was in metal, a pressed metal. Mm -hmm. And the uh, 21st arsenal actually produced a leather. Okay, yeah, scabbard. leather scabbard and frog. And as you can see, that the Hanyang also has the very long bell net and very similar to the Japanese Type 30. Right. And the gun itself is very long. Added with his long bell net, it would be horrendous. <laughs> it's designed for a time when they still figured you might be needing a spear to take someone off horseback. Correct. Did the Chinese use cavalry troops? Uh, not that many. The uh, Chinese mainly uh, uh, were infantry because the uh, horses is also an issue, right? To raise horses and yep. the uh, Chinese horses were not very high. So the cavalry was limited to probably northeastern region and uh, there was some uh, very good combat uh, experience over there. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you've uh, learned something and I hope you enjoyed the interview. Um, I appreciate Bin coming in to speak to us again. So as I've mentioned, Bin has published a book on uh, Chinese weapons of the Second Sino-Japanese War. Um, it's a real good informative book. There's uh, an English version out as well as the original Chinese publication which has uh, a bunch of real nice glossy color photos. So if you're interested in, it, interested in the subject, I would encourage you to uh, check out his website at ChineseFirearms.com and pick yourself up a copy. It's good reading. Yeah, thanks for watching. Uh, check back into ForgottenWeapons.com for more videos on interesting and unique firearms.